Yes, I'm still here, Hollywood. Just ahead on today's episode. I would say maybe spring 2022 was when Netflix kind of came out and announced, we're not making money. Um, we destroyed this entire advertising model that worked great for between 50 and 70 years. We blew it up. And now we're seeing sort of this um, mass exodus of production jobs from everywhere. Only 18% of all scripted programming is being shot in LA right now. You don't need one $200 million film that comes out. What if you made $102 million films? Now the name of our podcast, Still Here Hollywood, has always referred to me being back in the town where I held a microphone for so many years. Today, however, is a little different. Fewer television and film industry workers are still here in Hollywood because the entire industry is going through a bit of a crisis. Production has shrunken dramatically and producers, writers, hair and makeup people, caterers and dozens of other professions are leaving Tinseltown to find work elsewhere. Today's guest is not a household name like all of our other guests have been, but the information he brings will help explain what exactly is happening to La La Land. This is Still Here Hollywood, I'm Steve Kometka. Join me with today's guest, producer and de facto Hollywood expert, Patrick Caligiuri. If you'd like to be more involved with us at Still Here Hollywood, you definitely can. Just visit patreon.com slash stillherehollywood. You can support us for as little as $3 a month. Then you can see who our upcoming guests will be and submit questions for them. You can even tell us what stars you want us to have on as guests. You'll also get exclusive behind-the-scenes info, pics, video, and more. Again, that's patreon.com slash stillherehollywood. Start off by telling me a little bit about your history. My history? Um, well, I am... Uh... I'm a unscripted television producer. I started out, uh, I always wanted to do TV and film. So I went to Syracuse University, went to Newhouse School, graduated in television, radio, and film. I thought I was going to come out to LA to be a screenwriter for sitcoms. But when I came out here, sitcoms had already done their time. Because uh, when I was in high school, it was all friends and mad about you. And that's what I wanted to do. But when I came out, it was survivor and amazing race and big brother and um i fortunately at a very young stage in my career got on the amazing race as a field producer and was like i can travel the world and i can do fun cool things and this is the greatest job in the world and that's kind of how i kind of fell into my career and i do a lot with I guess you could call it adventure programming. I work a lot with Discovery, or worked a lot with Discovery, National Geographic, and uh, I built myself, my career from production assistant to showrunner. And I had a very great career, and I really enjoyed storytelling. I think at my heart, I'm a writer, and that's how I like to uh, approach projects. And then uh, spring 2023, the faucet went dry. And the well went dry, and uh, we're in a very new sort of stage in the evolution of media, I guess you could say. Is the industry changing? What happened? The industry is going through a period of evolution, but it was it's changing because of multiple reasons. There's not like a direct, like, here's what happened. But if you really want to kind of pinpoint where the start of the changes began, it was streaming. Uh, Netflix started it coming out and saying streaming is the future. And that was probably around 2016. They started in 2008, but really kind of picked up around 2016, 2017. That's when, when the other companies started looking at Netflix's model. What happened was then the pandemic hit. Now, all of a sudden, the entire nation is sitting in their living rooms watching TV. And streaming this need to basically create a streaming model just went into hyperdrive went into warp speed so all of a sudden disney and nbc and cbs or paramount networks are saying oh my gosh we got to catch up to netflix's model they're killing us right now so and wall street 
was like, that sounds great. We're all in. Here's a bunch of money. And we just had this sort of creation bonanza of content. They were making films. They were making television shows. Um, the work was just coming out of a fire hose. Around 2022, I would say maybe spring 2022 was when Netflix kind of came out and announced, we're not making money. Um, we destroyed this entire advertising model that worked great for between 50 and 70 years. We blew it up. Uh, we thought we have a subscriber-based system, but eventually you run out of subscribers. Eventually you got a plateau, right? There's only so many people in the world that are going to start kind of financing your company. Also, television was always free in a sense, mm -hmm. meaning that traditional broadcast, you know, TV was a way for advertisers to sell their product with material in between to kind of keep you engaged. So to switch to the subscriber-based system where you're first starting out saying, hey, do you want to pay $6.99 a month? Do you want to pay $7.99 a month? Actually, you know, to make our shows, we're going to need you to pay $14.99 a month. Actually, if you really don't want to watch the commercials, it's going to be $25 a month. So all of a sudden, these streamers became incredibly greedy and they're losing money really bad. At the same time, you have traditional cable, you have traditional broadcast, which that demographic is starting to age out. Nobody's watching, <laughs> no offense, but the people that are watching traditional broadcast and traditional cable, that demographic is getting older and older and older. That's not the consumer demographic anymore. So what you're seeing is cable is becoming obsolete, but these there's only like five major media conglomerates that run everything. And cable is still a necessity to put on the air, but it's now becoming a major financial suck to these companies. So now they're in a pickle where it's like we want to create more with streaming, which is also fighting this need to retain an audience against other social media platforms like TikTok, like Instagram Reels, and YouTube, which is now cornered about 10% of the entire streaming market, which is content that is made by individuals and not the traditional gatekeepers. So we're now in this world where the traditional media conglomerates that would oversee media have run out of money and the audience is being diluted completely. So that is sort of the crisis where we are at. And we've just, and on top of that, these, um, the media companies are, kind of going through what the audio what they're kind of going through what the auto industry did about 15 years ago they're saying hey you know it's cheaper to make a tv show or a movie in south africa it's actually cheaper to fly the entire you know to fly the heads of the department abroad to eastern europe and get a local crew there we don't have to deal with the unions anymore why do we have to do tv or film in Los Angeles. California is the most expensive state. Let's all move to Georgia. And now they're saying, well, actually, Georgia is expensive too. The film in the US is expensive. Why don't we just outsource this? And now we're seeing sort of this um, mass exodus of production jobs from everywhere. And 27% of the entire television film industry resides here in Los Angeles. How much? What percentage? 27%, according to Film LA. That doesn't seem like very much. But of, of the entire film and television industry, we're talking Bollywood, we're talking like globally. 27%. If you look at it at that, at that scale, it's, it's a massive. Oh, it is. It's massive. Only 18% of all scripted programming is being shot in LA right now. So when you look at those numbers, there's a lot of people that are, especially production people, who are financially hurting right now who are out of a job and what do they pivot to and the other sectors like tech they're undergoing constraints too they're contracting industry as well so we're finding a lot of people all of a sudden out of work not understanding why they're out of work that would be me right and starting to I, and it kind of came to a head to me one day um because you as somebody who loves what they do, there was a grieving process. I went into a full-scale depression in 2023 of 
oh my gosh, what's happening to me? What's happening to my job? I, uh, my career that I worked 20 years for is suddenly gone and you're desperate to get the scraps of your old job back. You're like, yeah, I'll do, you know, I'm an, I'm an executive producer, but I'll be a story producer. Just please just let me on a show. And then all of a sudden, maybe about a year of going through depression, anger, resentment, I finally reached acceptance of, you know what? You can't stop this. This is the world changes. The world keeps ticking, oh, whether that. whether you're you're with it or against it. And if you're with it, it's going to make if you go with the flow, it's going to make your life a lot easier. So I said, OK, well, if we're at this forefront of change, where are we heading? How can we, especially as creatives in an industry that has been dominated by non-creatives who have been making the calls, the gatekeepers, how can we start going back to doing what we love doing and producing content in sort of this new media world. What is this new medium that we're, we're going to be extending? And I think a lot of it is going to become more independent in, in the future years. One show like Game of Thrones, which came out every Sunday night, that was, I think, the last show that I could remember where people kind of get around and be like, did you see what happened on Game of Thrones last night? It's crazy because you can actually talk about it, discuss it. When anybody watches different seasons, you're watching at different times. You can't connect with other people over the programming. So you can say, hey, it's a good show. Watch this season of this show that came out or watch this season of this show. But you can't really connect with other people. That was sort of the beauty of traditional linear programming. But... Also, at the same time, the younger generations, you say Gen Z, even even myself, I'm a, what they call a geriatric millennial. Um, we we don't consume media the same way. You know, if you turn on your TV now, it's appointment viewing. I don't turn on TV just to surf to see what's on the channel. Like, what's going on? I turn in because I'm like, I have to watch this show that is dropping tonight. It comes out on Thursday nights. And then I turn my TV off and then I go on my phone and I'll scroll for the rest of the time. And I'm not saying me personally, I'm saying the collective people. <laughs> you know what? I, uh, when the Men Menendez Brothers um, Netflix series, nine episodes dropped, what, was last week or two weeks ago now? Uh, in one sitting, I watched all nine episodes. You know? Yeah. You don't have to wait anymore for... No, you don't. And, and there's something like... The sad part about that is you don't retain the information i feel like as much when you watch one of these shows and it takes two years for this next season to come out because you watch all nine episodes or ten episodes if you're lucky to have ten episodes most of them are eight or six you watch them you consume them in one sitting and then two years go by and you go i forgot it was a great show i completely forgot what happened and I have to almost have to rewatch the series, the first season, just in order to pick up the second. Patrick, tell me this. When I was coming up and trying to get a job in television, I worried about three networks, mm -hmm. ABC, NBC, CBS. Yep. Maybe a few independents here and there I would send my tapes to, my resumes. Now, it seems as though there's all kinds of things available, but you're telling me at the same time they're kind of going away as well. A hundred percent. It's It's this... Do, trying to dominate viewership. But here's the, also the other problem is tech came in to media, right? Yes. And you have, you, you've seen what Elon Musk did to Twitter, you know, cut, cut, cut. And that type of thinking or leadership does not work in a creative industry. You're trying to have a digital, you're trying to have digital companies take over an analog industry. You know, and, and John Stewart said it well, it's like TV just doesn't function this way. Have you ever been in a writer's room? It's one, it's boring as shit, but it's also just people banging their heads against the wall, trying to think of something. I need an extra two hours to come up with how this character does this in the scene. And people that are, you know, lawyers or looking at the bottom line, they don't understand the creative process because creativity, it's not something that can run solely on deadlines. We do it in, in, in TV and film. We've learned how to do it. We've learned how to make, sort of kind of do this dance between the creative process and functioning as a business. But what the new sort of tech industries are saying is like, that business doesn't work because we're wasting money. How do we squeeze every last drop? You know what? We don't need new films. What's going to work solely now is, is intellectual property and celebrity-driven content. 
We don't need new ideas. We can make just another superhero movie and they're going to go. But now all of a sudden, audiences are like getting served the same meal over and over again. They're saying, I don't want to go see another superhero movie. I don't want to go. I don't want to go to the movies anymore. Movies used to be fun. I used to love going to the movies. I used to like it was an experience with my friends. It was an experience with my family. But there's just you watch a movie now and you're like, Meh, it was okay. Now it's a very selective process. Okay, that movie I want to see. I want to see, and when you see it, it's not that great. The one I want to see right now is SNL. I just found out that it's the SNL, um, how it all started and everything. Oh, right, right. With uh... It's streaming. <laughs> I don't even have to go to a theater to see it. Right. Exactly. And that used to be a great time, Exa like you're saying. Exactly. It's it's But also it's like the pandemic kind of shifted this thing where it's like, they're saying, well, where do I make the most money? Because here's sort of like the, the rut that these streaming services have put themselves into. Because in order to keep a subscriber base, they have to keep putting out content, right? But at the same time, film also works in a, in a, in a way where you have to release it in theaters. But I also want my subscribers to stay on my channel. How am I, and I'm still losing money either way, whichever, whichever way I go on this. Because streaming is not producing the, the cash flow that cable and broadcast wants did. And so what are they doing? They're rebooting everything. They're, they're actually, we're not seeing much of it. I mean, in terms of We went through a period where they. They're booting is yeah. what they're doing. They're, they're getting rid of, they're cleaning house. You know, Paramount has taken 15% of its workforce and said, see ya. They're trying to save these companies by slashing and slashing and slashing. But that's not going to help your product when you have a creative product, which needs time to incubate and blossom and bloom. And I think the frustration now is with directors and writers and producers to say we've been sort of at the heel of these companies because it's the golden rule. Whoever has the gold makes the rules, mm -hmm. right? I can't finance my product, but at the same time, there's so many great stories to be told out there. There's so much great scripted content. There's scripts that have not seen the light of day just because there's like, well, you know, but we need another Wolverine movie. We need another Beetlejuice. Let's get all these guys out of retirement from the film they did 40 years ago. I bet, and, and that's gonna, that's literally gonna bring the audiences back. It's gonna bring back the audiences that saw it 40 years ago, but it's not gonna bring back that you need know, walkers and wheelchairs to get into the theater. Exactly, exactly. The younger, they're still not understanding the new generation. And the new generation is seeing anything that's put up on YouTube. And I don't think there's a an understanding of, of the content. It's, it's, it's this idea that you could just put any content out there and people are going to consume it. But I think this is what's going to separate the great storytellers from the content creators. Well, producer Patrick, <laughs> what does your future look like? That's a good question, isn't it? Um, I am not saying no to anything. I want to sort of embrace the sort of the indie wave that is happening. I think what we're gonna see is a lot of producers and writers start taking initiative of their own. I think the big question is how do we fund it? How do we fund independent projects? Because I think the, the belief is we can start making more indie films. Instead of, you don't need one $200 million film that comes out. What if you made $102 million films? I mean, some of the greatest films that I knew from the 80s and 90s, comedies, they're not that expensive to make. Or just a good storytelling. If you know how to tell a good story, you can captivate and, and keep your audience riveted. So my future is... I'm trying to see how we can keep our industry alive, but perhaps uh, create a new ecosystem for it. A new ecosystem or ecosystem? Ecosystem. One, trying to get the ego out of the ecosystem. The ecosystem is what we have now, but a new ecosystem. Is there a solution? You know, you're talking way above my pay grade. <laughs> I never had a focus. <laughs> my uh, the, the love of my job came from sitting down and talking to stars. Right. I love that. <laughs> and now you have to have a, an economics degree or, or, you know. Well, I don't think so. I think I think a lot of great storytelling comes from the gut. You know, I don't think an 
if they figured out what audiences want, we still wouldn't be having flops, right? If, if they could run things through data and algorithms and they say, well, the audience wants this. Well, why do we have Mad Max Furiosa? Why did that, like, completely shit the bed? Like, I, they still haven't quite figured it out. You know, I think they're, they're, there's only so much that the Marvel movies can, can, can carry. Um, but I think they're still going to, they're still having a problem retaining audiences. What's the last good movie you saw? Last good one. Like the last one, I think a movie that makes me, a movie that makes me emotionally fulfilled. Um, the one that I could think of recently, and this is maybe even a couple years old at this point, was Coda. Uh, I don't know if you saw that. You know, when I lived out here and I worked in the business and I had to see everything. <laughs> it's an independent film. That's why. It's Aha. Not... Coda. Who was in that? <sighs> Help me Man, out here. You're putting me on the spot. It was, uh, Coda stood for Child of Deaf Adults. And I think it was a French film that was remade into an American film. Um, and I think it performed at Sundance. But it was about a dog. I'll tell you what the premise was. Okay. I can't tell you who was in it because I think it was a lot of... it was. It was actors that I know who what their faces are, but I couldn't tell you their names to right. save the life of me. But it was the daughter of two deaf parents, and she could sing, and she was an excellent singer. And, of course, to her parents, what did that mean to them? And it was just so emotionally riveting. I was crying like a, a baby, and I don't cry that often, but movies, a really good movie will make me cry. And I think I was just like... I needed a moment after seeing that film. And that was a, that to me is like, that is a storytelling. That is the magic of filmmaking that has been lost, I think, over the past decade. Do you think you'll find that magic? I think it's, oh, I think it exists. Magic's there. I mean, it's just the human endeavor is always gonna, is always gonna win. I think, I don't wanna like bash the industry and say that, you know, all hope is lost. It's not like, I don't think these, corporations are going to fail. I don't think it's going to be like CBS is going to close its doors. But I think the power dynamic is going to shift where a lot of the creatives no longer see that they have to be in control. They don't have to get their material watered down. There doesn't have to be, you know, the VP has to look over at the VP who's never worked in film or television at all that has to make creative notes that make no sense. I think we're going to start seeing a rise of like, how good can we make this stuff? Because the good stuff, the cream is going to rise to the top and people will take notice of that. And we'll be right back. California is now kind of looking at, well, what if we actually incentivize smaller productions? What if we incentivize two to five million dollar films? And to my point earlier, you'd rather see 100, two million dollar films being made than one $200 million film. That keeps everybody employed. What incentives are other cities and countries giving to producers to lure them? Well, other states are giving great incentives. Georgia has an extra 10% they'll give to you just by putting their little peach logo on the mm -hmm. back of your film. So the incentives that California has just are no match to some of the other states. Uh, especially Georgia. We're starting to see Kentucky come on board to be like a major contender. Because it realize it's like you don't need Los Angeles necessarily to be the movie capital in the world anymore. You can make it wherever you can without that sort of like the where the movement of technology has led us. But at the same time, um, I'm actually talking with some government officials in Sacramento right now over what is the next move for California. And they actually brought up an interesting point, which is why do we want to incentivize these major corporations that have been greedy and are most likely gonna say, we're gonna move out of California anyway. They may stop the bleeding. So California is now kind of looking at, well, what if we actually incentivize smaller productions? What if we incentivize two to $5 million films? And to my point earlier, You'd rather see $100, $2 million films being made than one $200 million film. That keeps everybody employed. That's what, every, what everybody wants right now, is everybody wants their jobs back. But when you have five major companies that are kind of like holding the entire production process, um, I want to call it hostage to a degree, 
then these production creatives are going to have to go to other places. What about AI? How's that coming into play? AI is a tricky one because it's a blessing and a curse at the same time. AI as a tool works. Like it's great when it, I can organize notes or it could go through a legal brief and pull out things that I need to know. As AI create completely taking over the creative, would anybody see a movie where you know everybody is fake? Well, certainly not gonna pay for it. <laughs> That's 100% true. But I don't know if audiences are willing to accept that. But I think that's where a lot of the people that are looking at their bottom line are saying, they're saying, well, AI can do all the writing. It could do all the acting. It could do all the set design. We're, they're moving towards AI, but I don't think, um, but I think for creatives, it's a, it's, a, it's a very slippery slope if you're not careful. And I think one of the things that we're looking at is how can AI help productions? How can it help the individual filmmaker, but still not take their creative away? Wasn't That was one of the big um, stumbling blocks in, in the recent strikes. Exactly. And, and California has done a really good job of protecting AI, but the problem is you can move to Nevada and shoot your show there and you don't get your productions. Or you move out of the country and you do your production outside the United States where there are no unions or protective AI measures. So again, it, there's, a easy, there's quick workarounds. That's the problem. Um, what about the big stars and their equally big paychecks? Are they gonna go away? Uh, I think you're already kind of seeing it, especially with broadcasters. There was a big announcement earlier this week with late night talk show hosts, with uh, like the GMA anchors, like George Stephanopoulos. They're basically like, don't expect a raise anytime soon. And these are people making $25 million a year. and Which is ridiculous to begin with. Ridiculous to begin with. But now there's nothing to justify it because they're losing out. These networks are losing advertising revenue. They, you can have somebody who's doing a makeup tutorial in their bedroom in Des Moines pulling in more viewerships than Good Morning America. And that's the truth of the matter. And I think the companies that who are the advertisers are waking up to that. And so I don't think like the massive paychecks. Also, this idea of celebrity is starting to get pushed back on. We're starting to see with social media, we're starting to see a lot of truth telling come to the surface. A great example is P. Diddy. Um, you know, the people that were massive stars all of a sudden getting exposed. And I think there's been sort of this like, oh, you know, remember OK Magazine? They have like stars. They're just like us. Well, they just are like us because they're human beings with their flawed characters. And we're seeing a lot of that now. So I don't think celebrity has the draw that it used to because people want to pick their own celebrity on social media. I like this person because they're a kind person. I like what they do, what they advocate for, as opposed to this is the big star of the big movie. I think we're starting to see the audiences choose the material they want to watch or the people they want to watch. And that could be a frightening, uh, that could be terrifying to the old system. And it could be uh, terrifying to people who are trying to get established. It could be, but at the same time, you know, maybe we do need this readjustment. You know, do people need 30 million? I think George Clooney had his film with Brad Pitt and they each got $30 million. You know, but you look at the crew, yeah, I look at the production assistants that are, you know, working for scraps of that. It just doesn't make sense for that to earn that much. Mm -hmm. And that much of your budget of your movie goes to that, to service that and everything else gets hurt in the meantime. How did you become the trusted voice of all things Hollywood? <laughs> is, that what, is that what they're calling me now? Yes. Um, the trusted voice. Um, so I hear. <laughs> I just wanna, well, let me back up. About March of this year, I was, I live in Northern California, so I hike a lot. And I had a lot of time on my hands, so I was hiking a lot. And I wanted to go on a hike because it, it releases endorphins. It makes me feel better. And this was kind of going through my depressive era. And all of a sudden, it just started downpouring. And I was stuck in my car. 
And I was just like, you know what? <sighs> I whipped out my phone and I just started ranting. And I was just like, the system is, is flawed. I have not worked. Because one of the things that you never want to do in our industry as an industry professional is admit that you are not working. Right. Or you are out of the game. Because all of a sudden you have your scarlet letter on you. Oh, oh, he's not working. But all of a sudden the opposite happened. The professional colleagues started saying, I'm not working to either. I've been out of a job for a year. And all of a sudden people realized that I stepped up to the plate and was willing to put everything on the line and say, this is what's happening. And it's a shame we're not talking about it where we've seen the collapse of the financial institutions, we've seen the collapse of the automotive industry, but now we're having the collapse of Hollywood and no one is talking about it. There's a, probably a reason why, because the people that were, were, the people that oversee the media are the ones that are kind of overseeing this collapse at the same time. And I've always been somebody who has believed in telling the truth. And I think a lot of that goes back to, I started my career in news. I started my career as in a, I started my career in a newsroom at, at working at CBS News, working at Court TV. There was something institutional about telling the truth. And as somebody who was an executive producer that oversees my crews, my belief was always if I take care of my crew, my crew will take care of me. That was always my motto on set. And I started talking to my fellow colleagues and hearing the struggles that they were going through, executive producers making DoorDash runs, you know, selling off their inherited jewelry, um, diving into their personal life savings, and or saying that I'm putting everything on a credit card right now. And I'm like, these are the people that were who I looked up to. And, and no one's talking about this desperation that's happening. So I felt compelled to say something and then the more I started talking about it, I started getting the support system, names that I would dream about having a 10 minute meeting with were saying, go get them, kid, you're doing it. Keep going on, keep going, keep saying it. Say, you know, say the quiet part, say the quiet part out loud, talk truth to power. And as long as I stay true to it, and I stay honest to it, the community has really come together. And I've just been overwhelmed by it all, to be honest. So you're in a good place? Mentally, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 all of a sudden, I think, over the last two years, which have been really struggling, where I felt I've been pushing, I'm now feeling like I'm getting pulled because I'm starting to see little cracks into the, where we could go in the future. Um, tell me about your recent visit to the former CBS Radford lot, which oh, that, is right around the corner here. <laughs> That's actually a funny story. So I got invited by uh, Suzanne Marquez, who is the um, anchor, or not the, the entertainment reporter for uh, KCAL. And she wanted to do a story on me. And I said, yeah, sure. I used to work on Big Brother, which is stage 18. I'd love to go over. And, you know, the thing about the Radford lot, it was like Pee Wee's Big Adventure. You know, there's the guys moving the mirror and the showgirls and everybody in costume. Walk. And it was a ghost town. It was silent. There was no one around. I mean, you could have seen tumbleweeds blowing through. And I had worked on this lot for summers on end. And to see it. And you peek in, you peek into the sound stages, and there's nothing in there. There's no sets. It's just an empty, hollowed out building. And it was just like this is different this time. This is very serious. And when I posted that my experience on Rafford, I had friends that are like, I'm on Disney, and Disney's the same way right now. Or I'm on Warner Brothers, and Warner Brothers very similar too. Production has just left L.A. and it's not shooting here. Who was it? C.B. DeMille who said, "A rock is a rock." Uh he used to say, a rock is a rock, a tree is a tree, shoot it in Griffith Park. <laughs> when, they, when, when productions wanted to go shoot it. Well, now they're saying shoot it outside in Atlanta, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, for half the cost. I saw one of your um, episodes, I don't know what you call them, uh, but you were introducing all the people on the, mm -hmm. on the set. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about our little thing here, <laughs> where there's three of us. You have, sure. you have a big staff. 
You know, it, it, oh, I, now I know the one you're talking about. So the thing about production is people hear Hollywood and they have their own imagination of what Hollywood is. It's a business just like anything else. But who gets the glory? It's the executive producers and the talent. And those are the people that get the glory and the director. And then everybody else has kind of forgotten how many people are involved to make a movie or a television show. Everything from the lighting, the grip, the gaffers, the uh, camera teams that put everything together, the cinematographers, the hairdressers, the makeup, the people who do visual effects, even the graphics that you see on the screen. There are hundreds of people, creative, immensely talented people that come together to make a production. And that gets forgotten because nobody stays to watch the credits unless it's like where they're expecting the extra Easter egg scene at the end. But you, st when a movie airs and everybody leaves the theater, there's hundreds of names that are going up and down the screen. And the reason for that is those are the people that created this artistic masterpiece and they are all being forgotten right now. And I don't think everybody thinks, especially I say everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, People who, there's sort of an anti-Hollywood movement. And again, it's because they blame the celebrities that are flawed, the Harvey Weinsteins. And that is that is what Hollywood is. And it's no, it's, it's, it's a blue collar town where everybody is trying to work to support their family or put food on the table. And we got into this industry because we loved it so much because we, there's just some magic there. And that magic does feel like it's gone. But what I hope to do is to know that these crew members are not forgotten, that there is somebody advocating for them, that there's somebody going out to say, hey, we need to change the system and we can't stay quiet about it because we can build a better Hollywood, but you have to give the creatives the autonomy to do that. Good luck with that. <laughs> nice talking to you. Thanks, Pleasure, Patrick. Sir. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Still Here Hollywood is a production of the Still Here Network. All things technical run by Justin Zangerly. Theme music by Brian Sanishin. And executive producer is Jim Lichtenstein. <laughs>